Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Uttam Nath, and I, once again, on behalf of the Department of Botany, St. John College, welcome you all to our online lecture series. And this is the lecture number two, and uh, the topic of the lecture is current trends in molecular biology, and our resource person is Dr. Amardip Soren. Dr. Amardip Soren is from Bigorwa College, Guwahati Assam. Well, uh, before going into the topic, and before I give you time to Dr. Amardip, I want to take the opportunity to introduce him to you all. Uh, Dr. As I have told you, Dr. Amardip Soren has been working as an assistant professor in the Department of Zoology in Bibarwa College, Guwahati, Assam. And he has obtained his PhD degree from Northeastern Hill University, Meghalaya, in the year 2019, for his thesis entitled uh, Studies on uh, Entelmintic Efficacy and Toxicity of Albinorate. Dr. Shoren has published uh, one book and two book chapters so far. Moreover, he has published four research papers in different national and international journals, and he's currently doing uh, some research works on his field. And before I give this test to Omar, I want to, uh, I mean, informally, I want to inform you all that uh, Omar was also working in St. John College in 2012. Then after working one year, he went to Nehu. He did his PhD, and now he's settled in Guwahati. Okay, thank you so much, and I, I wish uh, his uh, knowledge, his uh, proficiency will uh, create a new vista to our students, and I wish all the best to Dr. Amardip, and uh, I uh, congratulate each and, uh, each and every one of uh, our participants. Thank you so much. Now I want to give time to Dr. Amardip, sir. Thank you, Uttam. Thank you so much for those wonderful words of uh, encouragement and introduction. I'm happy to be connected to all of you again, once again. Uh, uh, ultimately, the link with St. John still continues, and I'm happy that it's still continuing. Well, uh, I've been asked uh, by Sir Uttam to give a talk on uh, current trends in my uh, molecular biology. So I will try to do justice to the uh, topic, and I hope it will be an enjoyable time and a knowledge enriching session for all of us. So I will just keep my video off for some time so that uh, data can be saved. And uh, yes, we'll go on to the presentation. <clears throat> um, so I hope the, uh, the presentation is uh, visible to all of you. I will try to be as brief as possible and as simple as possible. Well, uh, now the question comes, why did the field of molecular, molecular biology actually develop, actually begin? And uh, molecular biology is not a very uh, old discipline. In fact, it originated only in the 1930s and 1940s. And later it became institutionalized only in the year 1950 and 1960s only. So um, no, what was the need for a new field of science to develop actually? Why did we need a separate field of sciences called molecular biology and uh, the likes? So to know this, we have to go a little bit back, back in history, and we'll see the actual reasons why this field was introduced and why did it become institutionalized. In brief, it is actually an offshoot of genetics. You know, when life sciences, the study of life sciences actually uh, was gaining momentum, it was genetics which actually took the first place. And then later, from genetics, several fields of science, including molecular biology, they were an offshoot, and they have become independent disciplines today. So to, know, to actually know what is the current trends in the molecular biology, we have to go a little bit back in history. So I've divided my presentation into four smaller topics. Number one, its origins, its classical period, and then its migration into biological domains, and the current status, that is its recent turn to genomics and post-genomics. <clears throat> now, you know, earlier when... Uh, when uh, genetics was booming actually in the field of life sciences, um, it was actually governed by Mendel's principles. 
and Mendel's three laws, which we all know today are the backbone of classical genetics or Mendelian genetics, such as laws of segregation, laws of independent assortment. And uh, uh, these, these were the actual mechanisms of gene reproduction, mutation, and whereas uh, certain fields such as gene reproduction, mutation, and expression, they remained unknown. So we did not, we did not know actually how this gene actually controls a particular character. So we knew that genes control, but the basis behind that, the chemistry behind that, we were not familiar with that. So following this, there was another scientist called Thomas Hunt Morgan. So what he did was, he utilized the fly Drosophila. And he established this as a model organism to carry out several tests or researches. And Thomas Morgan, he was also awarded the Nobel Prize for his work in the year 1933 in physiology or medicine. And what was his, his contribution to this field which gave rise to molecular biology is the role of chromosomes and what they play in heredity. So we know that chromosomes, yes, according to Mendel, they control heredity, but what is the role of these chromosomes? What do they actually do? And because he established Drosophila melona gaster, which is a fruit fly as a modern organism, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in the year 1933. Now, following this, <clears throat> another scientist, Muller, who was also a Morgan student. So what he, he further studied some other aspects of genetics. So what he did was he exposed the uh, DNA of this Drosophila to X-rays. And when he exposed this to X-rays, what happened? He found out that there were some changes in the sequences of the DNA. So this was the first time we found out that X-rays can cause damages. And these damages today are known as mutations. And uh, as a result of his work, Morgan was also awarded the Nobel Prize in the year 1946 for his contribution on uh, radiations or damaging effect of X-rays on uh, chromosomes. Now, uh, <clears throat> So uh, in spite of finding that X-rays cause mutations, he was not able to find out the reasons for uh, uh, how they express, how these genes express, and the properties of genes, and how they act, actually. So he established that, yes, X-rays, when, we ex when uh, DNA is exposed to X-rays, they will cause mutations. But uh, it's several other properties of the genes, and it's how they act. So these were still unknown. So based on this, Muller, Muller raised a question. What was the question? He, 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 he made a conclusion. The genetist himself is helpless to analyze these properties further. Here the physicist as well as the chemist must step in. Who will volunteer to do so? So we knew nothing about the structure of the genetic material. We do not know how they act. We do not know where the bonds are. We do not know uh, what uh, actual function they carry out. So because of these doubts, Muller himself asked a question. Now, this question did not go unanswered. And several people, they, uh, uh, they responded to his question. So in brief, if you see what is molecular biology, it is actually a combo. It is a combination of a geneticist, a physicist, as well as a chemist. Now, we will see why the physicist and the chemist are involved here. So now, because of this question, several scientists from other fields, such as chemistry, such as physics, they also got interested in this field of biology. So the first person to respond this was the physicist Erwin Schrodinger. Now this uh, Erwin Schrodinger, he was an Austrian physicist actually, and uh, he he is also well known for his uh, contribution to quantum theory and this very common Schrodinger wave equation. So he proposed that uh, he proposed that uh, uh, no wave he proposed wave function actually, and uh, he also cal uh, formulated a formula where we can actually calculate the wave function of a particle. So based on his knowledge on this quantum physics and the wave functions and all, he contributed again in the field, uh, field of biology, and for which he also got the Nobel Prize in the year 1933. Then he also published a very interesting book, which is called What is Life? And it's a very popular book. And several of the, of the scientists which we will encounter today, they were all actually inspired by this book which he wrote. And this is what compelled them actually to get interested in molecular biology or this new field of uh, 
life sciences. Now, following this, there was another guy called Max Delbruck. Now, he was a German biophysicist. So, the interesting thing here is in the field of molecular biology, the main contributors were actually physicists and chemists. The role of biologists is very less in this field, actually. So, what he did, what Delbruck did was, um, he, uh, along with uh, Alfred Hershey, another scientist, and uh, Luria, whom we will meet again in the later stages of this uh, presentation, they did a work on replication mechanism and the genetic structure of virus. So this, they, he was a physicist actually, but still his knowledge on, uh, uh, on fields of uh, quantum physics and other fields, he contributed in finding out the replication mechanism and also the genetic structure of the virus. And uh, for this, he was also awarded the Nobel Prize in the year 1969. And his teacher, actually another uh, scientist who was a, a physicist rather, called Niels Bohr. He also contributed a lot in the field of molecular biosciences. Bio in what way? He actually derived the more atomic structure. And uh, depending on the atomic structure, other scientists, they could actually develop the of the DNA molecule, which currently we know, which was developed by Watson and Crick. So a lot of physicists and uh, chemists actually contributed to this field. Then um, Niels Bohr was also awarded the Nobel Prize for this, for his uh, contribution to atomic structure in the year 1922. Then uh, following this, uh, there was another, another scientist called Salvador Luria. Um, he was uh, also a physicist who later actually became a biologist again. Now, one interesting thing here is, uh, you know, when uh, Schrodinger, Bohr, and Delbruck, when they actually shifted their focus from physics to molecular biology, Schrodinger in particular actually wanted to reduce this field of biology to another field of physics. But uh, he did not succeed. So there were other scientists such as Bohr and Delbruck. What they did was they tried to maintain the sanctity of this field and made it a separate field of life sciences. Or else today, this field of molecular biosciences would have been coupled with physics. But that has not happened. Now, Salvador Luria, he was, uh, there was a group which was formed called the Phage Group. So this was a group which did experiments on bacteriophage. And uh, today we know that uh, bacteriophage using as a model organism, organism, several results, several studies has been uh, found out. Now, what he did was, um, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in the year 1969 for his contribution on replication and genetic structure of the virus. So this was another development in the field of molecular biosciences. And following this, his colleague, uh, Delbrick's colleague, uh, Linus Pauling, as we all know, he is one of the major contributors in, uh, in the field of uh, chemical bonds. All that we know today about bonds, covalent bond, ionic bonds, he's one of the main contributors in the field for which he was also awarded the Nobel Prize in the year 1954. So now what was Linus's contribution to this? He actually derived the nature of chemical bonds. So today we know that yes, carbon will bind to four molecules, four different molecules. Hydrogen will bind to one molecule. Oxygen will bind to two molecules. Nitrogen will bind to three molecules. So depending on these uh, explanations, today we know that yes, carbon will bind to four molecules. And that is how we have derived this ultimate structure of the DNA. And very interesting, he was also an X-ray crystallographer. So when we go towards the later part of this uh, topic, we will actually know what is X-ray crystallography and how it has contributed so much in the field of molecular biosciences. Now, uh, so if you see in the field of molecular biology, what happened actually? It was the rise in experimentation. So because of the rapid rise in experimental procedures, this contributed to the rise in this new field called molecular biology. Now, so recognizing this importance of these new physical and chem uh, structural chemical approaches, the director of the natural sciences, who was Warren Weaver, he introduced the term molecular biology in the year 1938. And uh, he, I quote his statement, he said, and gradually there is coming into being a new branch of science called molecular biology which is beginning to uncover many secrets concerning the ultimate units of the living cell in which delicate modern techniques are being used to investigate even more minute details of certain life processes. So as molecular biology progressed, 
it was due to the fact that experimentation saw a rapid rise so had experimentations not raised we wouldn't have the field of molecular biology today Now with this, we come to the different phase that is called the classical period. So what happened in the classical period, it actually began with the discovery of, uh, uh, discovery of uh, the double helical structure of DNA by Watson and Crick. So there is a story again behind how Watson and Crick actually discovered the double helical structure. You know, uh, based, on the ex uh, based on the findings of Paul, uh, Linus Pauling, then Erwin Schrodinger and Salvador Luria, these two people, Watson and Crick, they met at Cambridge and when they found out that their interests were the same they decided to work on the structure of the DNA so uh, what happened actually was there was another scientist who was uh, by the name of Morris Wilkins and Morris Wilkins was working with another scientist called Rosalind Franklin and Rosalind Franklin was also a physicist and she was also working on the structure of the DNA so what Rosalind Fra Franklin did was along with her student she collected her own DNA sample and exposed the DNA sample to. So when these X-rays fell on the DNA, it made a shadow. And this part, this picture of the shadow, when they saw it, it formed a helical structure. Now, since uh, Wilkins was working with Franklin, what Wilkins did was he took the images of these X-ray diffraction images of the DNA of uh, Rosalind Franklin, and without the consent or knowledge of Franklin. She gave these images to Watson and Crick. Then Watson and Crick, they saw these images and later they derived the uh, uh, double helical structure of DNA. So if you see the major contributions here, it was actually given by Rosalind Franklin and uh, Watson and Crick and Wilkins. They actually just made use of her data and uh, for which they also got the Nobel Prize for the double helical structure. Uh, so this is the, uh, their story actually. So uh, the classical period actually began when this discovery was made and today yes we know that the structure of the dna it is a double helical structure we also know how many bonds which molecule bonds with which molecule <clears throat> so this is where we see the field uh, we see the contribution of x-ray crystallography so had x-ray crystallography not been there it would have taken even some more years to develop the actual structure of the dna so with the structure of dna in hand uh, uh, the uh, the focus of molecular biology shifted on how the double helical structure it actually controls the mechanisms of genetic replication and various other functions so uh, as a result what happened because we know that the we know the structure of the dna now and we know that yes this dna or the uh, genetic material controls various other characters so this was for the first time that the dna was called as an information Earlier, people had called it as DNA or the double helical structure or, uh, or and, uh, various other names. But since after the discovery of uh, DNA, the term information molecule was introduced. And today, sometimes when we, when we uh, describe DNA, we also say the genetic information. So this was the first time uh, uh, the term information was denoted and used for DNA. Now, uh, uh, Watson and Crick, when they published their second paper, they also used the term information to denote the genetic material or DNA. And they have they made a statement in the second paper. It therefore seems likely that the precise sequence of the basis is the code which carries the genetic information. So two new words were introduced here. One is code, which we all know genetic code is, the, uh, is a combination of three uh, nitrogenous bases which code for a particular amino acid. So this was for the first time that code and information which were earlier used only in the field of uh, computers. They were now started to being used in the field of biology even. And based on this, Watson, uh, sorry, Crick, he developed the central dogma of molecular biology. And today we know that, yes, this genetic material has to undergo transcription. Transcription is a process in which the information that is present in the DNA is transcribed or made into a mRNA. Then what happens? Translation. What happens in translation? The in, based on the information that is transcribed from the DNA to mRNA, translation or synthesis of proteins will take place. So based on these discoveries, ultimately Fra Francis Crick, he actually described the central dogma. And depending on this central dogma, several researches are taking place even today. Now the reason why I'm actually describing the classical period 
and uh, its origins it's because whatever discoveries were ma were made at that time they are still applicable even today and you uh, experiments on these topics are not yet completed so uh, several top several uh, similar experiments still remain undiscovered so scientists across the globe they are still focusing in understanding the central dogma in understanding mutagenesis which was developed by muller in understanding the characteristics of genes so the topic transcription and translation itself they are very vast topics every day if you uh, if you uh, keep uh, following researches you find different molecules that are involved in transcription processes that are involved in translation processes again this again varies from species to species some proteins may be found in a particular organism some proteins may not be found now so this this crick he characterized the central dogma as follows once information has been passed into a protein it cannot get out again so in more detail the transfer of information from nucleic acid to nucleic acid or from nucleic acid to protein it is definitely possible but transfer from protein to protein or from protein to nucleic acid is totally impossible so from the from the genetic material that is the dna we ultimately get a protein product so this is what happens in every living systems it doesn't go the other way it doesn't uh, it's not that the protein is synthesized and then from the proteins we get the mrna strands we get the codons and then we get to the dna it is not like that so it happens in in one particular direction that is from dna to the mrna and then from the mrna to the proteins or polypeptides and not the reverse way so following this uh, several other experiments such as uh, uh, meselson and stall where they discovered that uh, uh, you know they did experiments on bacteria using uh, uh, isotopes and there uh, they discovered how dna was actually replicated the semi conservative uh, mode of replication which we see today it's actually their discovery and interestingly not always uh, uh, semi conservative replication takes place today we know of uh, different types of replications where both the strands are new strands and one strand is completely the old strands so there are different ways of replication i mean these are actually developments in molecular biology field now uh, after this there was another another interesting discovery which is called the overlapping genes now what is overlapping genes uh, you know uh, earlier it was known that a particular region gene is actually a functional component of a dna so if you see the dna it is very long but the whole dna is not useful there are specific regions of the dna which perform some function and what is the function the function is to produce a protein as a result of transcription and translation so earlier people thought that genes are actually independent one particular gene is completely independent of the other uh, gene but later what what was discovered that some genes they overlap some regions may be falling in two different genes so if you see the figure the first two and the red region they are one gene and the second gene if you see the first green box and the remaining two red boxes they form the second gene so the 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 second green box and the first white box they are overlapping that that means they are components of both the genes now again after this what happened a simultaneous discovery what was that split genes split genes in the sense we know that a gene is not continuous it has some regions in between them which are interrupting the gene and they are called as the introns so what we know so after that we discovered molecular biology discovered a new phenomenon that is called as splicing so what happens in splicing these introns or intervening regions they are cut off by enzymes and these exons or the expressing regions or the actual functioning regions they combine together and it is this region or uh, which actually takes takes part in translation now after this another interesting discovery took place now we know that yes the gene is not continuous it has some it has some uh, intervening regions and some expressing regions called introns and exons respectively now interestingly another discovery happened now that was alternative splicing so splicing as we know is actually removal of these interrupted regions or introns now what happens in our alternative splicing uh, if an mrna strand is there uh it can form different rna transcripts so here what is what, what happens in splicing the introns are removed and the exons come combined together so for example in the figure let us say there are four four exons or expressing regions so what happens in alternative splicing 
exon 1 exon 2 exon 3 can form one mrna strand and form a different protein and alternatively what can happen exon region 1 exon region 3 and exon region 4 can form another mrna and form a different protein and similarly exon region 2 exon region 3 exon region 4 they can again form a separate uh, mrna strand and form a different mrna protein so from one mrna strand after it undergoes uh, removal of introns we can get different types of protein products based on which regions or exons are taking part in in that particular translation process so this was another interesting discovery and even today i mean uh, several experiments on alternative splicing are still conti continuing uh, because see ultimately the dna as we know it's a very lengthy molecule and different uh, uh, types of exons can be combined together to get different types of proteins and current research is focusing on finding what are the different possibilities of alternative splicing that can take place and it doesn't end there what is the protein it produces and further they, they are also trying to describe what role or what function this particular protein plays in that particular organism so uh, <clears throat> so now uh, yeah, now what happened after the after these uh, developments or discoveries what has happened now this field actually started going molecular you know uh, several physicists and uh, chemists they contributed we saw their contributions so oh, it was already going molecular we were venturing into the atomic structures into the atomic molecules which are present in that particular compound or proteins or uh, any uh, biological molecules so what what actually led to these uh, scientists going deep into molecular fields was actually their discovery or the uh, findings of a study by Francois Jacob and Jacques Monod. So the guy in the cigarette is uh, Jacob, the guy uh, looking uh, to the top is Monod. So what was their contribution actually? They discovered or they found out that expressions or behavior, it does not depend totally on the genes, which was actually Mendel's uh, theory or classical Mendelism or classical genetics. So what classical genetics thought that it is a gene which completely controls every character. But according to Jacob and Monod, they discovered the lac operon model. And uh, they concluded that, yes, environmental factors also play a particular role in gene expression. So depending on lactose, its presence or absence will activate or deactivate the gene. So if lactose is present, the gene is switched on and it will do its activity. If lactose is absent, there is no point in keeping the gene switched on. It will remain switched off. So this was another contribution to uh, 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 molecular biosciences. Now following this, <clears throat> there was another scientist called uh, Seymour Benzer. He was actually a physicist. And like I told earlier, in the field of molecular biology, the maximum contributions was given by biology, uh, sorry, physicists and chemists who actually diverted their study from their phys uh, physics and chemistry field to biology. So this Seymour Benzer was also a physicist, uh, American physicist. And he did a very interesting study on the behavior of uh, Drosophila. So what he studied was phototaxis and circadian rhythms. So what is phototaxis is actually, it is uh, the response of a particular organism to light. And again, what, is, what are circadian rhythms? These are actually, uh, 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 certain cycles or certain processes that happen on a day to day basis in every organism. And you know, because of these contributions by Seymour Benzer, today we have a new field of science which deals with the rhythms, and that is called as chronobiology. So, with the development of, uh, uh, of uh, molecular biology, it actually again gave birth to various different fields of sciences. And one such science is chronobiology today. And today, yes, several researches are going on in chronobiology how uh, several uh, hormones such as melatonin, how it actually controls various rhythms in our body, our sleep cycle, uh, our uh, various other behavior that we do during the daytime. So uh, this was uh, Seymour Benz's contribution to molecular biology. And uh, uh, following this, there was another scientist called uh, <coughs> Sidney Brenner. So what Sidney Brenner did was he actually developed an animal model called C. elegans, in short for Senior Rabbitis elegans. So 
ultimately if we have to carry out ex experiments we have to use some model organisms we cannot use humans uh, if we use humans there are several ethics uh, involved and that is a totally different lengthy process so he developed a model organism called c elegans to carry out certain studies and because of his contribution uh, in developing c elegans as a model organism today we know a new field of uh, study which is called as apoptosis in cell biology apoptosis is actually cell programmed death you know when an organism actually matures from uh, uh, infant to adult some uh, cells are lost for example if you say a woman in when she is pregnant no she uh, her uh, abdomen gains a bigger size but when she after pregnancy and giving birth the size again reduces so it's why because of apoptosis and this study of these uh, programmed cell death was actually contributed by uh, sydney brenner who actually developed c elegans as a model organism and in c elegans the interesting thing is we can actually literally count the number of cells that die and we can uh, he came to a conclusion that yes in c elegans initially it had this many number of cells but after cell death or apoptosis it has formed it has uh, it has currently this many number of cells and in addition to this he studied the nervous system of c elegans and in addition to this again he studied the genetics of behavior that is uh, circadian rhythms and all how uh, uh, this gene controls our behavior for example we have different sleep cycle we have uh, we have in the daytime we are active in the night time we sleep so how this behavior is controlled so interestingly what has happened here in molecular biology uh, there was a shift from actual field of biology and it went into the nervous systems and the genetics of behavior so max perutz he was who was uh, another scientist he wrote in a letter to sydney brenner it is now widely realized that nearly all the classical problems of molecular biology have either been solved or will be solved in the next decade now because of uh, this i have felt long that the future of molecular biology lies in the extension of research to other fields of biology notably development of the nervous system development and nervous system sorry so what has happened now now these techniques or the aspects of molecular biology they were slowly diverting or going into other fields of sciences such as nervous system which is neurology genetics of behavior even cell biology and even developmental biology now what happens in developmental biology till uh, till earlier years we did not know what uh, biochemical reactions or molecules take part in the development of a particular individual in the child of a mother but today because of the contributions of molecular biology we know the bonds we know the uh, we know which gene produces which protein product and we know the functions of each proteins today we know how development takes place and this technique is particularly used today in developmental biology which is again a different field of life sciences so uh, so ultimately what has happened here molecular biology invaded the study of behavior and the nervous system so currently as such what has happened further new developments or new techniques started developing new research activity started taking place so these are some of the developments that happened during the earlier stages so the study of cells was transformed from descriptive cytology into molecular cell biology so earlier the classical field of science which deals with the study of cell and its components was called the cell biology but today yes it is called as molecular cell biology and uh, the reasons which i have described only earlier now the other development was what in the field of evolution you know earlier when people used to uh, uh, people used to uh, study evolution how did they describe evolution okay these two animals look similar so maybe they are similar they are their ancestors were they were they were having a common ancestor but today we know that yes just by merely looking at the characteristics we cannot uh, conclude that yes this particular uh, animals or organisms are actually related so today there is a new field and it is a contribution of molecular biology what we can do here we can come there is something called as phylogenetic or phylogeny method here what we do we compare the genetic sequences and then we develop a Uh, phylogenetic tree and from that we can conclude 100% that yes these two animals or these two organisms or species are actually related so this is another another important aspect in these developments was uh, molecular biology it contributed in evolution in helping actually find the relationship between two organisms whether they are really related or whether they are not related then next contribution was in the field of immunology 
So earlier we had earlier we, uh, we could only see the antigen antibody reactions. Like when you when we go for blood grouping, they take a blood, a blood blood they take your blood sample and they mix some anti uh, antigens and then there is clotting which happens or coagulation. So earlier actually people just saw okay there is clotting yes so that means there is antigen there is antibody. But today with the developments or contributions of molecular biology we can actually see the reaction happening. We can actually see at which location the antigen and antibody binds. And today we know that yes, in an antibody, there are two antigen binding sites. So each antibody can actually bind at specific regions in the antibody. And there are two antigen binding sites in each antibody. And that is how clotting actually takes place. Now, when, when, when two things combine, it forms a bigger molecule. And that, that is evident as clotting or coagulation. So this is another very important development or contribution of molecular biology in the fields of immunology. Now coming to cancer research. <clears throat> now we know that there are certain genes called oncogenes. Everybody has oncogenes irrespective of uh, whether you smoke or whether you don't smoke. Everybody has certain genes called oncogenes. Now there are certain uh, certain molecules which are uh, which are called as carcinogens. So what these molecules do they actually bind to these oncogenes and they activate the oncogenes. So when these oncogenes are activated, it creates a lot of mess in the body and that is when cancers develop. So this was actually another contribution of uh, cell biology into the field of cancer biology or cancer research or oncology. So lots of developments actually took place and uh, you know, uh, the process of ongoing molecular uh, 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 researches they amounted to using experimental methods from molecular biology to examine more complex phenomenon, whether it is gene regulation or behavior or evolution at the molecular level. So we could see uh, several reactions or several actions that is happening in any organism at the molecular level. So now another uh, a question came now. So now what is the aim of molecular biology? It is always, is it always striving to reduce to lower and lower and lower levels. So earlier we had chromosomes, we had DNA, and now we have gone to even smaller levels where we can actually see the protein they produce. We can actually see what function they are doing. We can actually see at which region they're actually joining or combining together. So these were some developments, earlier developments uh, in the field of molecular biology. Now, uh, now coming to the last uh, part, that is the current status or uh, what, what is happening at the moment. So now if you see molecular biology has shifted from, uh, shifted to rather genomic and post genomics field. Now, what do you mean by genomic? Uh, genomic actually means uh, the gene. So now whatever research we do, we do not do it on the chromosome as a whole or the DNA as a whole. We are going to further smaller regions. And that is why the studies are very specific. We target a particular gene only and we study in complete detail the protein it produces, what action the protein does, where it is, what is its target organ, where it binds to and the likes. So as a result, many leading molecular biologists, what happened, they were migrating into other fields of other fields. And as a result, molecular biology itself was going genomic. And another interesting discovery was that they discovered that the human, uh, uh, the human beings, they contain more than 3 billion base pairs in its genome. So if you imagine 3 billion, how much time it is going to take for, the, for uh, researchers to study the complete DNA. And then, uh, <clears throat> now what happened? There were the, uh, what were the contributions in the field of genomic and post-genomics? So what were the uh, developments or uh, researches that took place during this time of uh, genomic and post-genomic? Now, uh, very important discovery was or contribution was uh, DNA sequencing technique. So this was the major contribution why molecular biology went genomic. Had we not discovered DNA sequencing techniques, we wouldn't be able to go to genomic level. And who was the founder of this technique? Frederick Sanger. And today, yes, we have discovered, uh, we, have, we have invented probes. You know, the whole, if you study the whole DNA sequencing techniques, we, uh, the target DNA is, uh, uh, is a input. And then we have uh, probes. And then they actually combine and yes, uh, probes are actually known sequences. So because they are known, so we can, the region where they bind, we can know what is the sequence present there. So this contribution of DNA sequencing by Frederick Sanger was a very important contribution in this field. And even today researches based on DNA sequences are even going. 
even the today the field of science is which is uh, dr dr i was going to interview once uh yeah how many slides uh, do you just have just three more was because somebody has just three more yeah three more okay somebody had, somebody has actually uh, entered there as uh, presenting something so your slides are at, at the corner now and it has become very oh, all small. right all right so so is it i think it, i so think it is three slides yeah i think it's clear now just three slides it is clear yeah. but all right just three clear. slides okay. yeah so following this there was another important contribution by edwin southern who discovered southern southern blotting and after that again we got northern blotting and western blotting where we can actually detect dna rna and proteins now uh, so now uh, these fields actually uh, developed further with the development of human genome project so after the bombing of hiroshima and nagasaki what happened the department of uh, energy in usa they wanted to actually find the genetic defects because muller had already announced that x rays when we expose dna they will get, they undergo mutations so this uh, they wanted to study actually how these mutations are affecting human race so the human genome project was produced and then later uh, uh, because of that several genomes have been sequenced to date and uh, today we know that yes how many genome uh, how, what is the total number of genes produced in each uh, organism so this was actually the new developments in the field of molecular biology now uh, uh now yes uh, coming to the actually what is happening now in the current uh, uh, current what is the current scenario of the contributions of molecular biology so uh, i've just listed a few uh, very recent uh, studies or very recent work that is actually going on now the first one is biochemical mechanisms significant for tumor uh, tumor biology yes uh, we know that due to different changes in lifestyles and food habits uh, tumors or cancers are on the rise so now there is an intense study if you go to any institute you will find uh, cancer biology labs so what is the uh, motive of cancer biology labs they want to find the biochemical mechanism behind each cancers so biochemical mechanism means what are the enzymes involved what molecules are produced that actually cause the development of these cancers now the next next recent development is the method to test fluorescent biosensors before they are synthesized so what happened here they have discovered actually a molecule which is called arc light arc arc light this this uh, discovery was made in rice university and uh, what is the main finding of this is that this arc light is a molecule what happens here it can detect voltage changes so in our body also if you see there is a lot of uh, uh, biochemical reactions happening which involves voltage voltage means uh, difference in charges and how vo actually voltage is actually produced when there is a difference in charges so what they have discovered this arc light uh, molecule what it can do is actually it can detect changes in the uh, voltage so when the voltage is uh, low it actually glows and the, when the voltage is high it actually the glow or the brightness reduces so this is how we can actually study uh, voltage changes in the human body and because they are fluorescent we can actually uh, follow or detect them easily the next development is the pooling power it reveals new insights into membrane dynamics in uh, human cells so this uh, study was done in the university of uh, exeter in the uk so uh, what they have done is here is actually they have studied uh, uh, the peroxisome the peroxisome as we know it, it's a very important fun it it's a very very important organelle it takes part in photorespiration in plants and in humans uh, uh, not just humans uh, uh, in humans and other animals it also does uh, oxidation of fatty acids Uh, and as a result what happens hydrogen peroxide is formed and the the enzyme catalase it actually reduces the hydrogen peroxide which is toxic into uh, water so what happened here is uh, uh, they have discovered a, a a molecule which is called as miro1 m i r o and the number 1 so this protein what it does it actually attaches to peroxisomes and what it does it combines these peroxisome molecules with motor proteins motor proteins are proteins which carry a uh, anything to from one place to the other place so if you see the cell also for a, for an organelle whether it is mitochondria or anything to carry out its particular function it has to be it has to be placed in a particular location endoplasmic reticulum if we have to be near the nuclear membrane so every organelle has to be in a particular position so even peroxisomes to con to carry out its functions and also its divisions its reproduction it has to be placed at specific locations so what uh, how does it happen so this protein called uh, miro1 
it actually attaches these peroxisome molecules to the motor proteins which in turn carries the peroxisomes to specific locations and as such it carries out its own function the next next reason development is high resolution imaging uh, to view how fungi actually grow you know of course we have uh, high imaging techniques such as scanning electron microscopy transmission electron microscopy but these uh, these techniques do not allow us to see movements so there is a new uh, a new technique they have discovered that is called uh, uh, a new uh, which can actually take uh, ar around uh, which can actually take an image every 50th uh, uh, 50th millisecond so milli uh, millisecond means what you you when you when you divide the second into 1000 parts so every 50th part an image can be taken so actually you will get lot in one second you can get several images so actually then uh, combining these images together you can actually see how see the reaction or the changes that is actually happening and they use this technique to actually study how fungi actually uh, actually grows and uh, they found out another molecule which is called as a chsb which is actually present in the tips of the fungi so this molecule has to be actually moving only then it will uh, help in the growth of a new hyphae so this how it moves uh the uh, this was founded during this experiment studies now coming to the fourth development that is trna scraps in mosquitoes they play an important part in spreading diseases so now if you see uh, this experiment was done in a uh, university of missouri on the uh, uh on my, uh, mosquito which causes yellow fever and dengue which is called aedes aegypti so uh, what they discovered that was that uh, this mosquito depending on its on its sex depending on its developmental uh, position and depending on the strain they possess different rna scraps trna scraps what are trna scraps now these are broken regions of 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 an of a trna and they are uh, they are prevalent in several organisms and they sometimes interfere with the normal dna and trna so depending on uh, so they found that uh, this mosquito depending on its uh, uh, developmental stage or sex or strain they possess different type of trna scraps and depending on that we can actually find what type of a mosquito a particular uh, 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 what type of uh, stage a particular mosquito is present at the moment the next discovery was the vitamin c so what they did was they produced a molecule uh, in tokyo university of tokyo this molecule is called r2c molecule so what this molecule does is it is actually a fluorescent molecule and it has a very high affinity for vitamin c so when it attaches to vitamin c you can actually trace where vitamin c is for, uh, going in the body this is another development then uh, uh, the other three are actually on stem cells you know how stem cells actually uh, in cosmetics what they do is uh, uh, they actually stem cells actually they uh, help in anti wrinkling or anti aging then again stem cells of dental origin you know when we reach a particular age if the teeth falls it will not grow again so uh, there are uh, present ongoing researches to develop stem cells which can actually develop into tooth and then the last is stem cell therapies for reversing vision loss now when aging happens vision loss happens actually so there are uh, studies or researches actually to develop uh, uh, i mean uh, or prevent vision loss is actually ongoing at the moment so these are some recent developments in the field of molecular biology there are several institutes which carry reaction which carry uh, molecular biology intensive research the best example is uh, uh, center for cell and molecular biology at hyderabad then mysore university which offers msc and phd in molecular uh, molecular biology and several institutes in, uh, such as nehru shillong tespur university cotton tripura and assam university i just mentioned some institutes from the northeast india if you google definitely you will get a lot of institutes uh, where molecular biology research is going on in, on a very high scale so with this i come to the end of the topic i hope i have made justice to the uh, uh, presentation i will be happy to answer the questions over to you sir uttam Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Amardeep, and thank you for your well-articulated and knowledge-imbued lecture. I hope, no, I'm sure our students has learned a lot from your lecture, especially uh, the stu BSc students, those who are having uh, having the, the molecular biology paper. Mm -hmm. And if there are any questions, then uh, participants can use the chat box. Or if there is no questions, no interrogation, then I'd like to call Dr. Anula to offer the vote of thanks. Hi. Yeah. Thank you, Sir Uthan. Uh, what a wonderful session we had, Dr. Amar Deep. Thank you.
Yeah, it's so good. Uh, for those students who doesn't know Sir Amarti, as Sir Utam has mentioned, he was uh, working in St. John and I got the opportunity to be with him as a colleague. He left us uh, with the great purpose of doing this uh, research and he has this honor in his cap today, Dr. PhD, Dr. Amartip Sorin. And then I'm so happy you are in a renowned college now. But at the same time, uh, we can totally understand how much you love us, you love our college, that's why you are back. And then, you know, today you are giving us this class. Thank you so much for having such a kind heart. I speak here on behalf of the botany department and thanking you for taking time out and giving us such a good, powerful lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, for the students, uh, one thing that Dr. Amardip has mentioned to us is, you know, uh, it very clearly rings to my mind and it will be there forever, I'm sure, as a science scholar, all of us. Uh, he mentioned why I'm presenting so many pages on the past workers is that research is still continuing, research is still going on. Yeah, <clears throat> we learn a lot about the characteristic features of genes, central dogma, mutagenesis, like that, but still the oldest research has not in ended, it is still going on. So I'm sure our students has been motivated <clears throat> through your speaking, Dr. Amardeep, I'm sure they are motivated because the students, you, you students, my dear students, you are the ones who has to come up, you know, and then proceed with the research that is still going on. This molecular biology research will never end. It, it will become more and more interesting. It will become more and more complicated, but it is the most renowned subject and it is in, in the field of research, more, more, the most renowned subject, I should say. It is an elite, and whoever works on this also are the most hard-earned people. They earned in every aspect, honor as well as, um, yeah, financially also, if the students are looking out for future career, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I am sure the students are motivated a lot, yeah. Please don't forget, my dear students, what Sir has mentioned. This research will never end, it will go on. So, um, you know, uh, Dr. Amar Deep Soren has uh, really given us uh, the, has, has been the motivational speaker today on the subject. And if you take seriously the students also, I'm sure this will lead you further, okay? Thank you, Dr. Amar Deep Soren, yeah. Pleasure. May God bless you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I would also like to acknowledge Miss. Athang Lo, the head of the department bought me. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I think it's a network problem. Uh, Hello? You are not audible to uh, especially for me, I'm, I don't know about others. Am I audible, my dear students, colleagues, everyone there? Hello, ma'am. She's audible. Hello? Yeah, I'm audible. <coughs> yes, okay, okay, I got it, yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Athang Lo. She is the head of the department of Emmanuel College. Thank you for your presence. And we look forward to more of your presence, the rest of your colleagues, as well as your students, as we conduct the series of webinar. Mr. Tang Long. Thank you, students from... Well, I hope Mem has uh, finished. No, uh, not yet. I don't know. Uh, I cannot hear her at all. Yeah, thank you, uh, students can, from can Assam. You, can you communicate me with your WhatsApp or something? I cannot really hear. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, administrative head, principal. Thank you, students, for your participation. Yeah. Our HOD, Sir Uttam, cannot hear me, but I hope at least uh, the rest could hear me. Okay, we had such a good time. Have a pleasant weekend. Bye bye.